Malcolm Van Delst, and this is an excerpt from Do the Wrong Thing, a book series or extra long novel that opens with a woman describing her suicide attempt as ordinary, like brushing my teeth. In an attempt to answer the question, why did I do it? She tells her life story. We're about a third through book four, or maybe half, I don't know, whose working title is Eyes of Different Colors. Thanks for having patience with the repeating material as I work through a new order for this section of the book. Last week, Ava learned that she can paint, tried to panhandle on the street, and ate at a couple soup kitchens. This next chapter is called Falling. God, he is beautiful. I never look at him or try not to. My eyes constantly disobey. I keep my head down so when they do stray, I see his running shoes or whatever they are, black, leather, ankle high, not docks. He's glued to the band, some semi-famous group who, no, 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 this is wrong. I did watch Ben at Great Etienne. We were standing together, Johnny, Emily, him, Greg, and a couple others I don't know. It's true that I was deathly silent. Ben is the most beautiful creature in the world. I've fallen completely in love with him, but no, he'd never talk to me. Hopelessness is smaller and more cliche than one of those angels on the head of a pin, but if it exists, nothing else does. We trudge to an all-night diner after the show. The tables are full, so we sit at the bright yellow counter, Ben right beside me to my left. Did you like Cryptic Zombie? He tilts his head towards me. Yeah, I mumble. I stare into the space between the counter and my face. Johnny says you live near Nerd and Doof. I am air dissolving into something grotesque and solid, killing all life. I live at Nerd now. My bagel arrives. I am the hole in its center. If only it were an ocean to drown. What the fuck? Ben shifts beside me. What did you think of Cryptic Zombie? He asks whoever is sitting to his left. You guys ready to go? Johnny inquires after about an hour. Emily nudges me. I don't respond. She nudges again, and I grab my wallet and pay my bill without saying anything. We all walk home together. Emily leaves us at Ledger Street. I walk into the Pioneer for my Saturday morning breakfast shift. Emily looks up as I enter and smiles cryptically. You know, like she knows something I don't. A sideways half-smile that she combines with a raised eyebrow before looking back down again. Hi, I say when I reach the back of the restaurant. What's up? I heard a vicious rumor, she says, half smiling again. I don't say anything, but let my face smooth out and open up, waiting. What is it? I ask when she doesn't respond. You know that guy, Greg? She's half smiling again. He likes you. I snort. I wouldn't go out with that idiot if he was the last guy on earth. Remove. Reader, after you finish this sentence, put this book down, point into the sky. Pretend I'm there like the Virgin Mary floating on a cloud holding little baby Jesus, though instead he'll be a 27-year-old man, red hair, one green eye and one blue. Point at me and laugh. Let yourself go. Really let go. Whether you're in a library, coffee shop, sitting with a girl or guy you want to impress on a bus, if you're listening to this on an audio book, pause, park first. If you're driving, ha, ha. Ha. Ha, 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 ha. Keep going until you really are laughing. Make yourself genuinely laugh merely by fake laughing. Keep going, though, until it's empty and unhinged. End remove. When I started writing, I knew this part would be hard. Shameful is what it is, and that's why I'm putting it I wasn't embarrassed when I was actually doing, okay, doing the thing means drinking my face off and falling in love with Greg. There, I said it. You'd think falling in love would be pleasant. I mean, I have no idea what I mean. How can you fall in love with a guy whose only job in the 27 years he's been alive is a six month stint sandblasting names onto gravestones? How can falling in love mean drinking until there's no money left, your money, my money, I mean. How can falling in love mean sleeping in filthy houses with no heat on bare mattresses on the floor, no food, no attitude was the only thing we had. Fighting norms and what? Polite society? Our parents? Fighting the expectation that we get jobs we hate and pay our own damn bills, I guess. Fighting, fitting in, fighting to be individuals, fighting to be failing. 
No, wait. We were, at the very least, different. Alcoholics, addicts, and God knows what else. Low self-esteem east us. Even in those punk houses. Take away the black jeans and band t-shirts, and all you had was the gross and sad rooming house I looked at right before moving in with William. Even in those punk houses. Well, many of us ended up back in our parents' basements or childhood homes. More than a few will die or be permanently institutionalized. One of us will become the manager of a horse ranch in the Barbados. Legend. Hero. Someone who made it, whatever that is, found a girlfriend who could provide him a comparatively glamorous livelihood. The night after the cryptic zombie concert at Nerd and Doof drowning my sorrow over Ben, who's sitting across from me as Greg glues himself to my side, leaning in, telling jokes, and making sure our beers are never empty. Greg is not ugly. He has a large nose, but that's no deal breaker. Thick auburn hair, prominent cheekbones, and freaky eyes that are two completely different colors. Heterochromia iridum. Only 200,000 people in the U.S. have it. He's funny and nothing is off limits for his jokes. Heroes don't fall. I mean, there's the French writer, Genet, but I'm not proudly buggering guys I meet in jail. Wait. Genet rhapsodized about how beautiful some of his men. There you go. He didn't fall. He kept looking, kept chasing love while I didn't. Love was almost literally staring me in the face, Ben, across the table. Though I'd learned soon enough that was Chimera. Did I need fake or dream love? Like all I had was a lie, and if the lie were gone... Ugh. Greg, beside me, desperately trying to make me laugh, cementing himself to me, stumbling after me as I leave, looking at me with all the desire or... Men need to pursue, that's their role. Eyes full of light and laughter, that's what Greg had. Was the light in one eye and the laughter in the other? Greg comes up the steps to my building with me. No, will I see you tomorrow? I laugh as I unlock the door. His forwardness funny, because he has this mischievous little boy thing going on. He nuzzles me. Then I'm at my apartment door, Greg still right beside me. He pushes himself against me, and I don't resist, ready to fuck, because really, there's nothing left. We fall into my apartment and down the two steps to the platform where coats are hung and shoes kicked off. Greg wears black runners. He could never afford doxies on welfare, has never even bothered to become a drug dealer. Down the stairs into my bedroom with the wall of electricity meters, we can't fall onto the bed because its wrought iron footboard is in the way. We maneuver around it and fall from there. Greg's maniacal grin, watching me as he works, and he's good. He's what I need, I suppose. He brings me to orgasm quickly. I can even get a second one off before he goes completely soft. He tastes of beer, cigarettes, and faintly corn. He will always taste or smell ever so slightly of corn. Is that hops? Do hops taste and smell like corn?